opportunity to meet someone new this weekend. And this is what happened. I said, hi, I'm Madison. She introduced herself. And we got to talking about what we were studying in college. And I mentioned that I was a senior biology major with minors in chemistry and dance. She kind of looked at me funny. She said, science and dance? What? Why? So what happens when you introduce yourself? Do people shake your hand firmly and look you in the eye? Do they kind of shake your hand weakly and look over your shoulder? Do they smile or scream in fear or perhaps in awe? So I've had this opportunity to learn a very interesting mix of biochemical pathways and ballet combinations, but I've learned something that goes far beyond just getting my degree. There's this phrase in biochemistry called crosstalk. Crosstalk is when one ligand or singly molecule affects multiple pathways. It's this collaboration and communication on the cellular level. But this idea can be found and applied in other fields as well. We all want to be successful, but what I've found is we have these pre-existing beliefs about success. We think we know why today's successful people are successful, and consequently, we structure our lives following their lead. Because the most successful people we perceive to be singularly focused, we celebrate those who are successful in multiple fields because we believe their success to be uncommon and unreachable. But I'll tell you about three extremely successful people in history who did not just pursue one field, but engaged their minds in multiple fields. I'll explain a scientific study and a historian's research to demonstrate how we are limiting ourselves by believing that one side of our brain is more powerful than the other. What we can find is that consciously engaging our entire brain can give us the best chance for success. Focus limits success, but engagement or crosstalk unlocks it. And that's what I'm trying to convince you of today. So we have this belief that success is the result of our exclusive concentration on one field. So why do college students choose a major? You have to admit, it's really just that idea of having that dreaded undeclared major stamped on your face, your shirt, your transcript. That's enough to turn anyone green. But the point of college is to gain certain skills or to accumulate a knowledge base in one field, right? So when we choose a double major or a minor, we pick something that usually relates directly to our field, like physics and math, education and psychology, art and graphic design. If you can think back to your college days, it's hard to think of someone you knew who was extremely diversified. I can name those people on one hand, and I'm in college. And then in our work or professional life, we strive to become these experts, right? We've all heard this idea that it takes 10,000 hours to become the expert. And so we believe that through our exclusive concentration on one field, we can become the expert, right? Because the, the, the experts of our day have dedicated their lives to their field. Joshua Bell, the extremely successful violinist, has been playing the violin since he was four. Bill Gates has been programming and hacking since the age of 13. And Michael Jordan has been playing basketball since he was a child. But it's not just the famous people. People who around us are pouring their lives into their field. This belief of ours, that focus gives us success, doesn't just display itself through the hours we put in at work or the majors or minors that we choose, but it also displays itself through our celebration of those who are successful in multiple fields. We observe these folks and we see their versatility as uncommon and unreachable. Because in our culture, this sort of wide lens focus is uncommon. Right? We strive to be specialists, and so we focus on something. When we find a process that works really well in business, that process tends to stay within the business field. When military healthcare providers find a procedure or a treatment that works really well for traumatic injuries, that takes years to make its way over to civilian healthcare providers. There's this disconnect between fields, a lack of sharing, discussion, and communication. A good example of this would be September 11, 2001. So the Twin Towers are each hit by a plane and collapse. Right? There's mass chaos on the ground, not just by panicked civilians, but by and between the many responding agencies. Due to several factors, there was not a unified response. The different agencies worked in the different ways that they had each been taught to handle mass casualty emergencies. As a result, there was a lack of unified response, and there wasn't sharing or communication. Out of this chaos, came a reworking and increased training of NIMS, or the National Incident Management System. This system provides coordination between various groups, allowing them to work together. 
Today, we use and teach NIMS due to its ability to allow individuals or groups who usually work separately to work together, allowing them to accomplish something together that's bigger and better than what can be accomplished separately. But while this celebration of uncommon thinking may be typical for us today, is that the pattern that we find in history? All right. So as soon as I put this up, you knew this was Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, right? Da Vinci was a master artist. He painted approximately 15 paintings, including the Mona Lisa. So when we think about Leonardo da Vinci, we think about the time and the training he put in to become such an accomplished artist, right? But we forget that da Vinci has also been called a Renaissance man, meaning that he was successful in multiple fields. His drawing called the Vitruvian Man is an anatomically correct proportional rendering of the human body, which he created in the 13th century, okay, the 1400s. They didn't have x-rays, CAT scans, or MRIs. He studied anatomy through human and animal dissections, and he also dabbled in engineering. He created workable designs for the bicycle, the helicopter, the submarine, and the military tank, centuries before any of those came to fruition. So da Vinci was a master artist, anatomist, and engineer. His mind was engaged in multiple fields, and he was successful in all. Okay, what about this lady? So as not all of you have taken 20th century dance history, I'll cut you some slack. <sighs> this is Martha Graham. She was born in 1894 and died in 1991, and she has been called the pioneer of modern dance. So not only did she choreograph 181 works of dance, but she started her own dance company, the Martha Graham Dance Company, which still travels and performs today, and she developed her own style of dance technique called the Graham Technique, which is taught here at the University of Akron. Um, she also created a dance notation form. So for the non-dancers in the audience, dance is really hard to write down. Um, when a dancer or choreographer needs to take notes on a dance, they write it down how they personally will remember it. There's not a standard form. But Miss Graham wasn't daunted at all. She decided to pursue another aspect of her field and developed a dance notation style which is still used today. She wasn't exclusive and pursued multiple aspects of her field. What about this guy? Probably the you know, greatest theoretical physicist in history. Developed the theory of relativity, worked on the photoelectric effect, theories of the cosmos, did some work on mass and energy. So when we think of Einstein, right, we think of his extremely notable scientific pursuits. But that's not all. Albert Einstein was also an accomplished violinist. Stories are told about how, how he would be playing his violin all the while thinking about his latest scientific venture. In the middle of a song, he would have an idea and run over to his desk to write it down. If I was not a physicist, he once said, I would be a musician. I often think in music. So when we think of Einstein, we think of his more notable scientific pursuits. But upon further inspection, we find him to be a much more complex character than we originally thought. So Leonardo da Vinci, Martha Graham, and Albert Einstein all had a commonality. Right? They were each extremely successful in a dominant public area of their life. Right? They certainly spent lots of time on art, dance, and physics. But that area wasn't where 100% of their time was spent. They also spent time on anatomy, engineering, business, dance notation, and music. So we have this paradigm. The most successful people in history have not just exclusively pursued their field, but have engaged their minds in multiple fields. But we have grown up in an era and a culture that says that to be successful, we need to exclusively pursue one field. So where do we go from here? So how many of you guys would consider yourselves left-brained? Scientists, engineers, analytical, logical nerds. Raise your hand, be proud. All right. So the rest of you would consider yourself right-brained, creative, artistic people people. Again, be proud. All right. So we've all grown up understanding this left-brain, right-brained way of classifying people. But what if I told you that that may not be true? The University of Utah did this study in 2011. They analyzed 1,011 human brain MRI scans. And while they found that there are certain neural networks that are stronger on one side of the brain than the other, they found no evidence that one whole side of our brain is more engaged or connected than the other. So obviously this creates a contradiction. We've grown up believing and understanding this left brain, right brain way of classifying people. And because we believe it exists, we classify ourselves and then act according to it. Right? You all just did. You raised your hand when I asked if you were left brain or right brain. Did you notice one thing? I raised my hand both times. We'll return to that in a second. So Princeton historian Daniel T. Rogers examined the politics, economics, business, and social culture of the last century in his book, The Age of Fracture. 
He is convinced that we have transitioned from looking at the big to looking at the small. He describes the shift that has occurred as deep and found among all fields. He says, the process has been from grand to granular, from macro to micro, fragmented, voluntary, fractured. We've grown up in a culture that's becoming more and more specialized, or as Roger says, fractured. But this afternoon, we've understood that focus may be limiting our success. This cultural idea of specialization fits hand in hand with our belief in left brain, right brainness. But this focus is limiting us. So I told you all what the reaction I get when I introduce myself, right? People are confused when I present myself as this dichotomy. They just don't know what to do. But I am convinced that being in these polar opposite classes has allowed me to fully engage my brain. And I'm convinced that's why I still like organic chemistry. <sighs> but that is the key to success. It's not about involvement. It's about engagement. It's about crosstalk. What I've learned through being this artistic scientist, dancing nerd, is that in our world, success is often considered the result of our exclusive pursuit of one field. We spend our energy focusing on improving and engaging our brain in a small fraction of our entire brain. This exclusive concentration leads us to celebrate those who are successful in multiple fields because we believe it to be uncommon and unreachable. But on the contrary, what we've found is that the most successful people in history have not just pursued one field, but have engaged their mind in multiple fields. We are limiting and lying to ourselves by believing that one side of our brain is more powerful than the other. And henceforth, we live rather unengaged. So why are we segregating instead of integrating? Why are we dividing instead of multiplying? Why are we subtracting instead of adding? We need to choose to consciously live in the entirety of our brains and share our success with others. Collaborating, consolidating, and coordinating between fields can lead us to greater understanding and discoveries within and beyond those fields. So while I believe that let's dance is always a good idea, first, let's crosstalk. Thank you very much.